Hello, and welcome to Exploring Axon, a podcast where we discuss Axon Framework, Axon Server, and their ecosystem. I am your host and a software developer at Axonic, Sarah Tori. In this episode, I spoke with Rebecca Werfsbrock about responsibility-driven design, design heuristics, the importance of storytelling in designing applications and systems, and more. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and let's have a listen. Hi, Rebecca. How are you today? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining me so early in your morning. This is when I when I talk to people in uh, Europe. It's usually, I'm a morning person, so you're in luck. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. That's perfect. I love that. Um, I'm always lucky when uh, the person I speak with, my guest, is either a, an early bird or a night owl because it, it works either way. It's either really early in my morning or still during the day, which is nice. So I really appreciate having you. And um, I have several topics that I want to talk to you about today. But uh, before I get into that, can you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, your background, education, and also where are you located? Sure. Uh, Yeah. So I've been in the software field for a long time. Um, I uh, started school in and I was interested in everything. Um, I took cognitive psychology and then on a lark took a computer programming class with one of my roommates Mm -hmm. and I ended up uh, it was in four, about Fortran. That's back in the days when you just had programming languages for courses. Right. Um, and anyway, I ended up with a double major in cognitive psychology and computer science from the University of Oregon. And I haven't looked back since. Um, I uh, you know, live in the Pacific Northwest, just outside of Portland. Portland is a hotbed for a lot of things, object yeah. technology, patterns, uh, small talk, you know, it's a very innovative place. And I was fortunate to be in the middle of all of that. And Absolutely. then, yeah. And then, uh, 20 some years ago, I started my own consulting and training business. So up until year. that moment, were you working, uh, mainly on software design or architecture? What were you, your focuses yeah. were? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, at Tektronix where I had worked, I was uh, a principal, I ended up being a female, the first female principal software engineer there and worked on a number number of products, number of products. Uh, Mm -hmm. The last few years were using object technology and small talk. So we we commercialized small talk. So that's how I kind of got into the uh, uh, bent. And then uh, we went out to, you know, joined a company that was, uh, you know, in investing in product development and, and consulting and training about uh, design of applications. And that was uh, merged with Digitalk, which merged with Parkways. After a while, I went and did my own thing. But yeah, so. That's really awesome. So um, as you mentioned, about 20 years ago, you started um, having your own uh, consultancy uh, firm and you're doing a lot of uh, talks at conferences and you do workshops and so forth. Um, I will uh, uh, go a little bit deeper into some of the workshops that you do, but um, sort of generally speaking, I know you do many, many different things, which is really awesome. But what is the focus of your consultancy? What do you, I know, and I know you wear both hats of the psychology and also uh, technology, which is really neat. Um. So yeah, uh, I care about people communicating and thinking clearly and perceiving and and coming up with good software designs. And I don't mean U- UX design necessarily, but I mean the design and structure of, of an application or a mm-hmm. system. So yeah, it's basically uh, design design practices and, and whether, what's, whether it's at the application level or at an architectural level. Mm-hmm. So um, the folks that you usually um, work with or give the um, uh, workshops to, are they mainly um, the software engineers? Are they mainly business folks in the company or is it usually a mix of both? Uh, so it depends on the client. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, it depends uh, so, for example, I've I've uh, given architecture workshops for you know, companies in uh, Germany, um, mm-hmm. and they were engineers. So that was an right. engineering company. 
but yeah, I've uh, just down the street in Portland, have, we have done design training for application developers in uh, an insurance company, and they're basically IT. So nice. I think the practices and the ways of thinking transcend both business kind of applications as well as engineering. Mm-hmm. I like both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's um, and actually, that's one of the topics that I'm really interested in, the having the um, the two sides of basically a business working hand in hand to create a system or application that um, is is desired, which is uh, neat. And of course, there are um, many challenges that come with that, which makes it a lot more interesting, in my opinion. So that's uh, that's always a topic that I love discussing and going into details. Um, so I will come back to uh, some of the workshops that you do a little bit later, but. Um, Something I heard just recently, which was really interesting to me, and I am really dying to hear more about it, is um, someone said uh, that you were um, an inspiration for Eric Evans's um, domain-driven design book, the blue book that we all know and uh, always try to read and reference back to. So tell me a little bit about that. How did that come about? Well, uh, I've known Eric for longer than... Uh, his, I mean, for more than since his book has existed, and there, right. uh, it used to be that he was speaking at, at conferences and things like that. So uh, you know, he he was one of the people that was involved in object design and technology. Right. And uh, in essence, uh, I wrote a book with uh, two co-authors in uh, nineteen ninety. And, uh, you know, wrote another book with another co-author in uh, 2002. But in between that time, uh, Eric had been inspired by the way I'd thinking, been thinking and was working on his book. And I ended up, you know, talking to him about his book and reviewing his book in, in when it was in in flight, you know, in, in process. And, and some of the comments I made, uh, you know, had him change some of the things in his book. Mm-hmm. So he, he basically, uh, you know, I, I it encouraged him because this was good stuff. But yeah. at the same time, I had a point of view about design and perspectives that I think it goes, oh, okay. But responsibility driven design was a way of thinking about the mm-hmm. behavior of, interacting things as opposed to just struck, you know, the structural data centric view of, of objects that was a, a competing way of thinking. And I think okay. that kind of inspiration was, was something that, that he liked. Also the yeah. uh, level of thinking about something, not in terms of the various low level details, but in terms of responsibilities, so it's a little higher level view of, of, you know, to start of, of objects. Absolutely. So um, in your opinion, what do you think is the uh, main difference and also the um, similarities between responsibility um, driven design as well, uh, or as opposed to domain driven design? What would you say the differences are and also the similarities? I mean, there are a lot of similarities, but maybe like one or two. Uh, well, so as far as uh, uh, differences. Responsibility-driven design is a way of as a set of practices for thinking about objects and their interactions, or entities, or things in your application, whatever mm-hmm. level of your apps. Uh, you know, you're you're thinking about a problem, and how do you uh, how do they interact and communicate and collaborate together to work on a, on a design? And so, what roles do they take on? How do they? So, so Eric's view. Uh, was pretty much, um, you know, that was a foundational kind of way of viewing things. I'd say he layered on the top um, things that we had, uh, you know, talked about is that in business applications, and his focus at the time was primarily business was was about entities Mm -hmm. and, and relationships between them and aggregates and all that stuff. So that was the tactical OO design patterns that were in his book. So it's just an right. elaboration. But uh, the other kind of higher level stuff that's in the back of the book that people mm-hmm. didn't didn't 
get to, and I mean, they should have gotten to it, but they didn't get to it, about yeah. strategic design and separating uh, concerns and corruption layers and that kind of stuff were definitely mm -hmm. things that were uh, stuff that I wrote about in my second book about trust, antitrust, or to trust, identifying trust regions and whatever, but he just packaged it in a different way. So it's right. very complimentary. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And some of the similarities between the two that you uh, would think that um, are worth mentioning. Um, of course, there are many similarities, but uh, what do you think uh, some of the bigger ones are? Well, I, I tend to think that um, at the time the blue book, his blue book was written, my book is also colored blue. Both yeah, they're, they're both blue, yes. You say the blue book, and I'm going, man, which blue book? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to. <laughs> well, have we to know define it's it. the blue book, yeah. Anyway, my blue coffee <laughs> mug today. Uh, the blue book that came after your blue book, yes. Yeah, right. Um, so, uh, anyway, I, th I think uh, some of the differences were that there are in the, in the uh, tactical uh, patterns that are there, um, mm -hmm. little ways of achieving behavior that had been written about and given specific names. So I think that's that's a difference. Uh, some some of uh, and I at that time I was awash in many other patterns. So not mm -hmm. all the patterns that are tactical patterns uh, did Eric invent. By the way, mm -hmm. I mean the, right. the whole value and value patterns and whatever. But he just packaged them together. Today yes. people don't talk about those. Um, he also was influenced by uh, how do I structure an application so that I can mm -hmm. have a pure behavioral view separated from the data connections. And right. so that whole thing about repositories and getting, getting these things outside of that was, was you know, an extra riff on, on that. So, yeah. so they're very complementary. You know, I, don't, I don't think uh, the, the main difference is probably – aren't really very important. They're just, you know, I, I tend to think that uh, when I talk about design or perceived design, it's like, okay, I, I can slip into uh, either the tactical level or the strategic level and just it's very complimentary. Not, not a whole lot of differences. One of the uh, places that um, I saw this definition, this design heuristics that you had uh, brought into uh, light for everybody to really uh, pay more attention to, uh, was the article that you had written, which is called the, um, Are Software Patterns Simply a Handy Way to Package Design Heuristics? And um, at the beginning of the article, you're uh, mentioning how Billy Von Kohn, uh, who is a um, nuclear physicist uh, and a professor in, uh, I believe, the University of Texas in Austin, um, is talking about, and uh, he mentions that, um, uh, he talks about heuristics, and the way he defines it, uh, and I will read the, the very, sure. um, hopefully, a short excerpts on your <laughs> article. Um, he talks uh, about a heuristic as anything that provides a plausible direction in the solution of a problem, but in the final analysis is unjustified, incapable of justification, and potentially fallible which I thought was very interesting. So can you define that a little bit for me? Can you explain a little bit exactly what he means by that? And also what is then the connection between the patterns and heuristics? Okay, sure. So that's that's a few questions. Uh, so let me unpack it a bit. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just unloaded a bunch of stuff on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. So, so, so a heuristic... Um, just starting back um, to give a little background about this is there's there's other definitions about it, but I like this one uh, a lot. And Billy Von Cohen's work has influenced me to kind of raise this awareness in the software community. And I think I'm the one who sort of raised this awareness. And now I hear I'm glad I hear people talking about heuristics a lot, which is very cool. Um, yeah. So, so one of the things to think about is that his, in his definition is that sometimes we think of patterns or approaches as being 
solutions to our problem. And his definition says, uh, if I'm in engineering in the real world, uh, mm-hmm. whether I'm doing nuclear physics or you know nuclear power plants or I'm doing software design of complex systems, any approach I take is not guaranteed. Uh, um, and, and there are always competing heuristics out there right. um, to solve a problem. Uh, so we shouldn't just box ourselves in. Um, and, and sometimes we tend to think about here's the way to do software in a very rigid way. And when sure. you get down to it, it really, you have to, you know, see that the effect of applying a particular design approach right here at the point where I'm doing something with my design, whether I'm at architectural, it is not guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I have to have an open mind to get feedback. Right, right. to see what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's the case that have you ever been in a, a team where people disagree about what to do? I mean, oh, I have. many times, <laughs> countless right. times. Okay, so 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 the fact that they people do is because their heuristics that they're you know that are firing in their brains right now that are the important ones to them are probably different than yours. Right. Um, and 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 so, yeah. Um, if I'm creating a design, um, if I know um, a number of heuristics that uh, I want to use, um, then that's great. But a lot of times I have to fall back to, uh, you know, more primitive, you know, what are good practices. So one yeah. of the things that uh, Von Cohn talks about is there's three different types of heuristics. Mm-hmm. One of the heuristics being a heuristic to solve a particular design problem. So we're thinking, right. yeah, use the, use the, uh, you know, singleton pattern. I'm using that as the worst pattern. <laughs> you know, right. Like, yeah. Let's use the singleton pattern here. We just love the singleton pattern. Um, right. So it's, it's solving a particular problem or a perceived problem. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's one type of heuristic, but there's heuristics that guide us on what to do next. So if I'm in the d- domain driven design community, in order to get clarity on it, I might say, well, I need to do an event storming session before I figure out what the problem is that I want to solve. So that's a guiding heuristic, do event storming. And then the third type of heuristic is your values and beliefs about the way you're working. And those kind of heuristics are not technical, but they do get into differences between, well, how do you do test-driven development? Right. Or do you uh, or what do you value? Do you value consistency? Uh, Do you value uh, new technology over old clunky legacy stuff? Or uh, I'm I'm just saying um, and those contexts, the context you're in, your heuristics may change over time. So you don't keep them rigid, but they're all there uh, bouncing around. So to me. Heuristics and patterns, getting back to your last uh, part of that question, patterns happen to be what people wrote down as heuristics that they saw and they had a high value in. They don't write about Mm -hmm. patterns they don't like, right? Right. (laughs) But they're always (laughs) creating heuristics um, that they valued in a particular context, right? And, Mm -hmm. And so... If there were if they were good authors and pattern writers, they would tell you, you know, use it here. Here's some of the consequences of using it. You know, if they were in more detailed pattern form, but they're just a handy way. And patterns don't tell you everything. They're just a sketch of what to do. You know, there's yeah. there's so much more. You know, oh, let's do an anti-corruption layer. Well, what are the ten thousand other heuristics I need to do a good one? Right, for example. Right. I mean, so anyway, yeah. yeah, of course. So um, you did mention some of these uh, characteristics and that they're all various ways of doing it and they're all very different and they can um, basically um, either accompany each other or um, contradict one another. So it, it's just a lot of uh, decision making that goes into um, this process of designing, right? Um there were four items that uh, you had mentioned in your paper, and uh, they were some of uh, the items that uh, uh, Dr. Kern had mentioned, which are the um, 
ways of how basically he was defining it. And then you uh, brought those more into uh, the way of um, using these patterns in applications and software applications. Um, can we uh, compare the two a little bit and then talk about them a little bit? So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go through sure, sure. one at a time and then we can we can sort of talk about them that way. So um, according to Dr. Kern, he says that a heuristic doesn't guarantee a solution. And uh, in applications and software applications, you mentioned that the application of a pattern doesn't guarantee a solution. Uh, can we talk a little bit about that? I know you mentioned uh, some items on that, but uh, just in a nutshell, again, um, is it going back to uh, the fact that some of them are really contradicting one another, or there are so many of them to choose from, or uh, is it something more specific? Well, so I'm going to apply, let's say, uh, a, a particular pattern if I know about a pattern right now, yeah. I'm going to use a pattern, design pattern. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking it's the best way to encapsulate knowledge. I'm going to use that, go back to that singleton pattern. Right. Um, well, it may raise other problems that Sorry. <laughs> cause that's an obvious one that cause uh, backward progress actually, because now we have this state uh, that is locked into this, thing and we have to worry about creating, you know, uh, you know, anyway, it, it, it creates potentially, uh, you don't know that you've made forward progress with it. Now, some, right. some, path, so that's just a obvious, easy pick off. So, of, mm -hmm. you know, an example of something that I think it's going to help me make forward progress. And I have to apply successfully lots of different heuristics at the time. Um, so, uh, Another kind of example about not guaranteeing a solution is I may make a, a choice architecturally um, right. to do uh, something where, um, let's say, we're, we're using microservices and we want to have this conventional uh, convention that we designed for our APIs. And sure. we have a set of, uh, you know, I'm going to say uh, health monitoring kind of behaviors that we put mm -hmm. into our system. Mm -hmm. And we think, oh, oh, now we'll be able to tell, you know, everything's all convenient. Can, it will help us as we troubleshoot and, until you come to a situation where you have a, have a problem right. uh, where you go, oh, I thought, I thought this was handling it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and you go, oh, I guess that my, you know, uh, my uh, anyway, circuit breakers and my things didn't work because of this timing of this. Oh, I thought I was making forward progress by logging these things. I guess I screwed up. Um, but that, that doesn't mean that you throw your hands up and, and give right. up. But you say, oh, it's really more complicated than I thought. And here's what I should do. So that's an example of. I may do some things for a while thinking I'm getting forward progress mm -hmm. until, you know, a, a, a situation in the environment is right. more complicated than I thought about. Which then t takes it to the se uh, second part when um, he mentions that a heuristic may contradict other heuristics. And in patterns of speaking, um, a pattern may contradict or compete with other patterns, which which is fine because then that's, I, I think, the process of then going through through those patterns and picking and choosing what actually works and what doesn't work, um, which then goes to the, I, I guess, the third part of it when um, he mentions that a heuristic reduces the search time for solving a problem, which then you, uh, in terms of pattern, uh, you mentioned that a pattern collection or pattern language reduces the search time for solving uh, that problem which I thought was really interesting because it really does talk about uh, sort of going in deeper into these heuristics and really um, researching it a little bit more. But at the same time, it helps you uh, to reduce the, I guess, the ultimate search time in solving that problem. Yeah. Uh, now, I would say that in the software world, our, our patterns are not perfect. Sure. Um, <laughs> I don't and, think patterns are perfect in any world, <laughs> but well, and, specifically and in software. Yeah. It, specifically in software. And I, I think it's because we were kind of, well, we are still in a new 
way of writing about that. And we don't think right. about patterns. There's, there's other general heuristics that fit outside of patterns. They aren't patterns. They're, they're other things. Um, right. Uh, and, and so, you know, just because I know like domain driven design patterns, well, I mm-hmm. need to know a lot more general right. design heuristics that aren't patterns. So, um, it may reduce a search time at if I'm at a particular granularity. What do I do right now? Right. 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 But but it it, it may you know it, we still have a lot of uh, you know gaps in our, the way that we think. It's it's not totally structured. You know. So you have to go back to I think more fundamental heuristics about software design in order to make sure. progress. Absolutely. So. Um... Skipping a bunch of stuff because there's there's a lot more going on in uh, the decision making and using patterns and so forth as you mentioned. Um, but one of the things that uh, caught my attention and it was interesting was the last item that um, he was mentioning, and then you brought uh, some more clarity to that, which was uh, great. Which is the fact that the acceptance or applicability of a heuristic depends on the immediate context instead of an absolute standard. Um, but then you mentioned that the acceptance um, of a, a heuristic pattern depends on the immediate context instead of an absolute standard. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? What do you mean by the, what does he mean by the absolute standard? And what is your take on this immediate context versus this absolute standard that he's talking about? Well, so even nuclear physicists have to consider the current context. Sure. When they're absolutely. trying to solve. Well, I used to think they followed things much more rigidly. They had more laws than we did that they have to right. do. For, but those are the more fundamental constraints that they have to do. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and so <clears throat> I have to, as a designer, have to make a, a, a choice. Should I do this now? Right? right? Or if I'm working with people, should I do this now? Is this a problem? Mm-hmm. And so if I'm looking at um, patterns or design approaches or DevOps, you know, practices for delivering things, I have to mm-hmm. say, this is what I should be doing right now. And I, and it's like, I can't just take something out of the book of patterns and say, okay, right. just do this. This is the one. Yeah. This is the one. Um, and, and in fact, um, people should not believe that any sort of pattern that's like, say the tactical patterns Right. tells you everything that you need to do. So applying right. something. What, first, there's the choice of, should I do this? And then there's like, and how should I do this? Or a hundred more things that you're deciding, whether you're conscious about it or not. Mm-hmm. They don't. It's not a blueprint. Right. <laughs> I wish it was to make life easier, but yes. <laughs> um, so when I kind of talk to people about this, <clears throat> and this is... They, they kind of go, well, what should I do then? And the answer is trust your judgment. You know, you learn from experience. Yeah. Um, try it, but be open to feedback on what you've sure. done. Yeah. And I think it's um, important because one of the things that sometimes we sort of get hung up on is <clears throat> Um, As you mentioned, you want to sort of, um, as maybe a designer or an architect, uh, you would like to think about, okay, these are the patterns that I'm going to follow, or this is a pattern that I'm going to follow. But at the same time, as you mentioned earlier, things change, Um, your system changes, your application has different needs that arise without your uh, prior expectations. And then you have to adjust yourself as you go. So I think that's one of the things that... um, I value very highly about being flexible. And I think as um, I sort of think about myself as when I was younger and um, I joke about it sometimes that I feel like I was so inflexible when it came to certain things in life. And as you get older and of course, circumstances change and you learn a little bit more, you, as you mentioned, your life experiences change and you're like, okay, sure. I can be a little bit more flexible about that. And then in, you know, some of our cases, we have children and then everything just goes upside down and you have no patterns whatsoever. So. Well, the pattern you have is recognize that they're individuals, right? So right. If, you, if, you, if you have uh, the heuristic I apply for 
working with child number one. I happen to have two children, so yes, you, know, you, you get smug when you have one, one child. Oh, I know how to do it. And then you decide to have another, and you realize they're totally different beings. Exactly. And and that that's actually... Now, on the other hand, I know a set of heuristics that I love and cherish, right, that I'm going to apply right. as a designer mm-hmm. or as a parent, right? So right. if I like to read stories at bedtime, I'm probably going to do... So, so, you know, we do have heuristics that we don't have to totally switch them out. Right? Sure, so sure. if I, if I believe in uh, domain driven design, bounded context and language mm-hmm. definition, mm-hmm. that's pretty, uh, I'm going to say stable, but it right. doesn't give you all the answers. <laughs> yes. That's a foundation. Yeah. And then you build on it as you go and you change things here and there as you go, which is, yeah, absolutely understandable. Um, yeah, and I love that uh, the the what you mentioned about uh, the bedtime stories, and that kind of made me chuckle a little bit because <laughs> yes, that's my pattern to read bedtime stories, and now they're both kind of getting to the age that each one has their own preferences. So <laughs> bedtime story time takes twice as long. So, well, yeah. and 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 that's that's so. On the other hand, <clears throat> the expertise you learn uh, employing one set of heuristics can be applied to the other thing. It's just that the context, the book Mm -hmm. is, is different. The kind of books is different. So as designers, and and I've done this in my consulting practice, you know, you asked earlier about whether I'm, uh, you know, have I spent time in IT or have I spent time with engineers? And the answer is Mm -hmm. yes. Have I spent time with teams that are agile and teams that are not agile? Yes. And, you know, (laughs) uh, I, I can't define myself but what I do is I want to orient myself to the problem and the solution. So I get interested in most anything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if I if I engage, I'm gonna get get interested and in try to find out heuristics that work. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is actually a good thing because then um, I think that when it comes to heuristics, and we do mention that. Um, there are various types. They're um, they're competing with each other. They they can be overwhelming and so forth. But um, when you, I think, as you mentioned, when you talk to different teams and uh, talk about their specific problem or the specific solution that they're looking for, then it kind of narrows some of those heuristics down, which which is great. But lastly, um, in this particular topic, um, you talk about sustaining software pattern practices. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about that and what do you mean exactly by that? Sure. Um, so that was in the context of uh, that uh, bit of writing that you mentioned. Yeah. And, and I'm involved in the patterns community as an author and I'm on the Hillside Europe Advisory Board and the Hillside Board. For, and And the thing that I'm concerned about Mm -hmm. is that um, people need to keep patterns alive. Right. Um, And as we apply them, software patterns at various Mm -hmm. different granularities, anyone who applies them learns something. Right. And our perception of what a, a good pattern is is only changing if there's a feedback loop and that we know what the good ones are and we communicate them with each other and that we recognize that it isn't just the author, the original authors didn't invent it. They just captured it, if you will. Sure. Um, That we keep it sustainable, that we update it and refresh them and, and that we add our uh, bits of personal knowledge and context to a changing landscape. And yeah. so I think it's it's a sad state of affairs that either people don't know about design patterns uh, or uh, of the hundreds of them that are out there, but also mm-hmm. the fact that uh, there is sort of a perception that, oh, the, the people who, who wrote those books were the only ones who can change them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which, which is not true. And um, as you know, my background is in classical music. And when you were talking about that, it reminded me of um, when, and I think we had this conversation uh, before 
when I was in uh, undergraduate program, and we were given very rigid patterns to work when it came to um, music composition. So we were given these assignments um, on a regular basis to compose a piece of music and the patterns were given to us. And um, for the simplicity's sake, let's say one was um, a pattern that Bach used and one was the pattern that Mozart used and so on and so forth. And um, most of them were really based on the patterns that Bach and Mozart used. And that's why I mentioned the two. And so everything was quote unquote clear cut and you follow this pattern. And as you go, you have to make sure that you sort of stay within the boundaries. Now, as um, I became a senior and my undergrad and then moved on to graduate school, and then you realize that these patterns actually have to evolve and they have evolved because if we look at it from, uh, for instance, not to get too much into music history or theory or anything like that, but from the time that, um, let's say, Bach came up, uh, came up with some of these patterns and then Mozart came up with some of these patterns and then the composers after that came on and built on these patterns and made them um, that much more either complex or beautiful or in some areas simpler. So this really makes perfect sense to me when we talk about software um, patterns as well, because the the field of software engineering is relatively new. Um, I mean, within it's the the past hundred years, it's been you know developing quite rapidly. But the patterns that are coming up, they're coming up very quickly, and as you mentioned, it's it's important to keep them alive and it's important to sustain these patterns and also get feedback because some of the patterns can be elaborated into bigger patterns and more um, sustainable patterns and ways. And some of the patterns just sort of die out after a while, maybe if they're not. And, and some are, useful. right. And some are forgotten, uh, you know, just like uh, people forgot how to uh, blow a particular kind of glass in cathedrals, uh, right. but they shouldn't exactly. be forgotten because cathedral right. glass is very beautiful. <clears throat> so, <Yes. clears throat> The problem we have with software patterns is it's and it's a good problem to have is they come from many sources. Right. It's not just the minds of one or two people. Right. Um, and and it's hard for people who who wrote about those patterns to sustain them. They are not also the curators of those patterns. Right. Um, and and that's something we need to recognize. I was just talking to uh, Chris Richardson uh, the yeah. other day, and mm -hmm. um, he has a great website about his uh, microservice patterns. And I asked him, what's your community around that? And he goes, it's me. And I'm going, oh. <laughs> I mean, it's great. Um, so he's been feeling uh, that and it was his private conversation, but it's, you know, the, the point is there's a burden as an author. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, even the the authors of the very original design pattern books felt really like, oh man, we should be updating them, but they, but they didn't, you know, for yeah. a variety of reasons. And uh, I think that uh, it's great um, that people invent uh, and patterns are inventions of perception. Um, right. They're not inventions of things. They're things that they have observed. But anyway, mm -hmm. that, that, that you recognize that, we are all, um, you know, as designers and, and builders of systems, yeah. capable of shaping and reshaping things. And if we can yeah. articulate what we did, how we tweak things. And so sustaining things means as, as a software community, like rising up to the level to recognize that we can contribute as well. Um, Absolutely. So personal heuristics, um, my little riffs on this thing, they're all important to communicate. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the community because that's where um, all of the wonderful ideas come about and then people can exchange and make these patterns that much better, I think, that, um, as well. So that's, that's really wonderful. And find, and find new ones. And find, and find new, new ones. ones. Absolutely. Come up with new ones. That's always a really um, good way of discovering new things and making the old patterns better, but also uh, coming up with newer patterns that might be more useful for whatever problem that uh, people are trying to solve. So one of the things that uh, you briefly mentioned, and I'd like to ask you about it, you said uh, Dr. Kern actually uh, contacted you once you 
uh, started writing about um, uh, his uh, ideas and writings about heuristic and then you bringing uh, them into the world of uh, software architecture and uh, software patterns. Tell me a little bit about that. That must have been really um, well, it, exciting. It, it, it came out of the blue. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, his his wife actually contacted mm -hmm. me and said, yeah. Dr. Uh, Cohn has been working on a, a new book. Right. And I'm going, oh, wow, I want to know that new <laughs> book. Anyway, has been working on a new book for a few mm -hmm. years. Right. And he's retired and doesn't really get to the internet very much, but she collaborates and helps him so, uh, as he's writing. And she noticed, you know, I, I gave a talk about heuristics at like an interview, you know, so, so she was like, Oh, can we use this <laughs> quote? Um, can we use this quote about, you know, the patterns? Because I think they were delighted that it was, uh, you know, not, you know, into the realm of software and, yeah. and personal responsibility, if you will, for right. uh, personal heuristics. <clears throat> and so that was just like really, that's really cool. Really amazing. And I, it made my week, not my day, my week. <laughs> I, I was I just bet. like, whoa. Yeah. And it, so they're out there looking for this approach because in some sense, uh, they're really sort of countering or, you know, he's been countering the fact that, you know, engineering is just this rigid set of things that you do. And you have to recognize that even scientific theories are just, there's competing theories there's there yeah. heuristics as well and, and popping down into engineering that you need to think that way. But, you know, so anyway, I don't know if he will complete his book, but I, you, you, yeah. you probably I hope he does. does. Yeah. yeah. Um, he was a great inspiration and uh, a friend of mine who used to work at Intel mm -hmm. gave me this reading recommendation for that book. Yeah. And he says, I want to see what you're going to do with this. And it, it really, um, you know, I think I have made the connection to, to software design and, and patterns mm -hmm. that wasn't there before. And I'm very yeah. happy in the domain-driven design community that I'm yeah. asking people just comfortably use the word heuristic. <laughs> yeah, which is great. And actually, the talk that you mentioned, um, I will go ahead and include a link to that because um, I watched it and it's very, uh, really neat, fascinating stuff. So definitely worth watching and so that's the info up all the information. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 online. You know, I went after the magician. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. It was like I'm giving this talk to all these architects, and right before it was a guy who did card tricks about security, <laughs> and I'm going, and he did a card trick with me behind stage, and I'm going, what am I? How am I going to get? You're like, now I'm going to top this. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm I'm after in lunch. I have what 23 minutes to give this talk. <laughs> And I went after the magician. Oh my god! That's hilarious. <laughs> Props to I whoever okay. came up with the <laughs> with the order. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. The, well, I think it was like after lunch, let's have the magician. But you know, going after the magician is kind of a tough act. It's it's a yeah, it's a it's it's competition. <laughs> it's a real competition right there. <laughs> it's yeah, it hard was, to top yeah. that up. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. So. Um, as we're getting close to the um, end of our talk, sadly, because I'd love to talk to you for hours, but I wanted to also ask you about some of the workshops that you do. You do many different workshops and uh, in various topics, which is really fantastic. And as you mentioned earlier, um, they basically uh, catering towards uh, various groups of uh, individuals. So software engineers, architects, designers, um, even business folks and so forth. So, um, but there were two of them that I um, wanted to sort of talk a little bit more in detail about. One of them was the art of telling the design story. And the other one is the developing and communicating software architecture. Mm -hmm. The reason why I was interested was because I love, I love uh, design and I find uh, designing systems uh, very interesting. And um, also, Obviously, I'm interested in software arch architecture. So those were the two that I wanted to ask you a couple of uh, hopefully shorter questions. Um, let's talk about the design story a little bit. Uh, you mentioned that, of course, it's important to have uh, the, the storytelling part of a design, obviously. Um, 
But something that you mentioned that kind of caught my attention, which was stories worth telling. So what do you mean? How can you define which story is more important? Obviously, I have my uh, guesses, especially when it comes to business side of it. Like, what what is the money maker? So that's, I guess, the more <laughs> important story when it comes to maybe the business side of things. But can you give me some examples and some ways of um, recognizing why a story is more important than others? So, so <clears throat> I have gotten, um, I, I've spent... You know, I'm, I've, I've spent a lot of time doing consulting and it's right. very interesting when you find people who are good storytellers. So I'm not saying mm-hmm. that I'm the best storyteller, but I know a good story when I hear it. Um, right. and, and I also have learned a lot from being involved in experience reports in the Agile mm-hmm. uh, Alliance for 20 years. So I know about right. storytelling. And one thing about a compelling story about the design is it can inspire people. It can convince uh, other people about the architecture, that it's right. a good, good thing that you're recommending, that this is mm-hmm. the way we should go. This is the way we've had problems. This is why we're having problems. Anyway, so, mm-hmm. so storytelling is something, I mean, you have to understand why you're telling the story. It might be to convince somebody. It might be to educate someone that's new. Um, right. So, you know, what makes a good story? It's like, what do you want the audience to, to know mm-hmm. about? Right. So if I am, um, you know, telling a story, you know, it's not just, you now you said, well, if it motivates the business, um, yes. And then how am I going to achieve what the business wants is I have to kind of recast it in the way that <clears throat> makes them understand. So right. one of my favorite uh, storytellers of all time, and I worked with them at this company, uh, Freddie Mac, mm-hmm. that they do loan right. loan processing for yes. U.S. loans. Anyway, oh yes, yeah. oh yes, okay. my student loans came from that. <laughs> oh, okay, anyway, I know um, them. <laughs> so I spent a couple of years consulting for the chief business architect of the single right. family, um, and he was a master storyteller. And so every time he's adding a new feature. And they would do quarterly planning on this, you know. He would create great stories about why we should do this, these yeah. things this way. And he put together, uh, and anytime he had a presentation where he made a different story, he would like add it. And he had this uh, picture of Mount Fuji, you know, famous mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. painting at the front of yes. his, his, his slides on this saying, and here's another beautiful view of. Uh, you know, but but he would tell stories about why we needed particular features or what things would do, and mm-hmm. he would do it in a way that blended a bit of technology, but also the rationale behind it, and and unfolded in a way that the audience would understand. And he mm-hmm. just kept collecting these stories, and it was like okay. Um, nice. So that was uh, to me a master storytelling. Mm-hmm. Sometimes if you're creating a piece of technology. Um, and, and I've worked with people who design frameworks and right. frameworks. Yes, they want to tell everything. Mm-hmm. But if you're if if you know about telling a story, a good story is something mm-hmm. that leaves you doesn't you know doesn't tell you every last little thing that you found interesting. But it's the yeah. journey you want to go through, mm-hmm. right? So That's if I'm telling a story about a framework to people who are going to maintain it. That's a mm-hmm. different story than somebody who's going to use it. Right, right? absolutely. Yeah. So, so again, <clears throat> I think stories worth telling are ones where, yes, you, you're trying to convince people about ideas. You're trying to get people to understand why we did this. Mm-hmm. Um, um, maybe why we need to do this. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah right? So, so those are the you, kinds of... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned... Uh, dilemmas of storytelling what what are some of the dilemmas that we face is it dilemmas within teams or oh for sure yeah okay (laughs) so there's some of those so some of the some of the dilemmas of telling a story is i don't know if you've ever um had someone who they want their questions answered oh yeah right the business i want my questions answered and you're Mm -hmm. telling it to the rest of the audience and they're just kind of like sticking their head up and, you know, wanting to, to get to their point. Yes. Right. So that, yeah. that's, that's a, maybe in uh, 
uh, where you live. Uh, but in the U.S., sometimes people aren't so polite. So that, that's, that's somebody who, like... So then the other thing, uh, some of the other dilemmas of a story is, okay, <clears throat> I'm telling a story and there's multiple layers to it, mm -hmm. right? So how do I do that without overwhelming people? Um, right. So right. I, I need to kind of lead them to my conclusion mm -hmm. about why, let's say, like, we're taking the strategic approach in gradual steps, right? Right, right. So I can't just jump to the end of the story, mm -hmm. but I have to keep it interesting along the way. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, or, or you really, uh, when you're, you know, if it's an important story, and I, I did this, I remember doing this workshop in Japan, and right after that, I got this email from someone who says, I stayed up all night and rewrote what I was going to do to do this, you know, an architect to do a pitch yeah. And, yeah. and it worked. And I went, hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's that amazing. Awesome. Um, That's but, but you know, so, so we, we, in the workshop, we worked about stories that you may want to tell or, you know, mm -hmm. so we work on, on their, their problems. So there's some right. little changes on, on, on how to do that. But one yeah. of the interesting things, having conducted this a number of times is that, Someone says, I, I, I'm trying to invent some um, ways of visually representing this aspect of our system. So right. maybe we might just go off and spend time, um, you, you know, critiquing something that someone did or as a mm -hmm. whole group. So it's, it's a really fun you know, kind of workshop. And I can only imagine because. And designers, yeah. yeah. It's um, especially when it comes to uh, software designs and systems, sometimes it's difficult to. Uh, put things into uh, a visual sort of storyboard. And I think that that comes very handy when you can achieve that and when you can make that story interesting. Because I think I would imagine if you're presenting the story to a company as a whole, um, obviously, as you mentioned, you would have various teams, various departments. The story that you're telling them as a whole company doesn't have the same meaning for every department. And as you mentioned, somebody wants their questions answered before you actually get to that even section of what their concerns are about. So that's really that's really interesting to so, so, so you explore see, those. Yeah, so you can see that it kind of blends psychology with. Um, so we also oh, talk absolutely. about some some biases, that, mm -hmm. um, and ha how to address those. If if yeah. my storytelling is to convince someone, um, what are the common biases? that you have and what kind of critique you get and how mm -hmm. do you respond to it. So those kind of things. So for example, if someone is, <clears throat> uh, has an anchoring bias, you know, the first thing you say coming out of your mouth is very important because they'll fixate on one thing that they're listening yeah. for. Oh, you said right. this and not hear anything else. Exactly. Also, you know, and, and you need to, <clears throat> Remember that people, and as we're getting to the end of our interview, remember what you said first and what you said last and everything in between. In between, you forget. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I remember this. This is, this is really interesting because, um, you know, you, as, as you, uh, your background is in psychology and you're uh, really, truly interweaving the, the psychology part with the software engineering part, which is really neat. And uh, on, uh, in my end, I'm usually trying to get sort of like my musical education and background into things. And it's really interesting because what you said, the, the first part of the conversation and the end of the conversation are the most important parts. And I remember uh, having to um, design my graduate recital, um, the thing I needed yeah. to graduate. And uh, the, the, the pattern and the design of the order in which you perform and come up with the different sets basically that you have to do in, within your recital was so important because truly what you open with and what you end with is what people are going to remember because that middle set or two that you put in the middle and then most of the times there's an intermission in between nobody's going to remember that is they're probably snoozing halfway yeah, through it. Unless it didn't fit. Unless it didn't right. fit. You can't ignore Unless it. Unless it was very different. Absolutely. So that was, that was uh, yeah, it brought back so, back so many memories and uh, so many wonderful memories. But yes, <laughs> it was a challenge for oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, the last topic that I wanted to talk to you about, which is uh, the developing and communicating software architecture. And um, 
hopefully I can just ask a couple of questions that are not uh, too, too detailed because the, the, that um, a workshop I understood was a pretty um, extensive one as well, that, um, which, is, mm -hmm. which is understandable. But one of the things I wanted to ask you, um, which I think is a question that maybe is important, maybe not, I don't know, but to me is interesting, which is the question of when we're talking about designing a system or an application and we're talking about patterns, who exactly comes up with uh, these ideas of which patterns should we use, which designs should we use? Do you think it's best to go with sort of a democratic approach where everybody has their say and then you vote on it and then you go about, or is it more so that the software architecture or the team of the architect, uh, architects, um, let me go back, software architect or the team of the architects really come up with, with these answers? Or again, um, it depends. Yes. Yeah, the answer, yeah. The consultant's answer, right? It depends. Every answer to every question and, it depends. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. In in some sense, it also the, uh, the 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 criteria for who decides and how to do it depends on the size and scope of the team. And are we right. doing something new, or are we just extending and changing what we've done? Mm -hmm. So, for example, <clears throat> these days, you know, I I don't think that architecture by um, democratic voting is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I think that you need to get consensus and buy-in. Right. And, and so in some sense, that doesn't mean that I uh, dictate uh, decisions to people. Right. In fact, that, right. that, that will never get anything done. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, I've worked on teams in a variety of different approaches. And depending on the scope of the project, maybe that we go off and do some, I'm going to say, rapid prototyping and experiments before we want to deploy something that's going mm -hmm. to take, you know, 200 engineers to develop. Right. In that case, we don't do it in an isolated vacuum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we involve a set of people that are making decisions. It depends right. on the scope. If I'm in a small yeah. team, uh, that's working well, like like let's say cucumber folks who make yeah. some major decisions. They do it collaboratively together because yeah. they're a yeah. small, uh, fast moving team. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on, on the other hand, uh, if I am trying to communicate stuff that's products across that you know that spans countries and time zones, right. you know the so you, you know this sort of leads me up to the thing that uh, decision making. Uh, it, for uh, sustainable architecture is a workshop that I'm working on with Ken Power and going mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. deliver it because, yeah, it, it does depend on, on the context. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very interesting ideas and uh, topics. And hopefully at one point in the future, I can have you back and we can talk uh, more about um, some of these other workshops that you work on because they're all very, very interesting um, to me. And I'd love to learn more about it and more about um, your ideas as you know, you've been in the field for a long time. And um, yeah, it's always a pleasure to learn from you. Thank well, you for so the time. Be, yeah, it was great. Uh, so uh, on, on that note, it'd be interesting for me to have a conversation or two with you about some of your favorite design heuristics. Yeah, that would be I'd great. Like to, I'd like to collect them and... <laughs> I, that's that's just a, a hobby of mine. I have conversations with people and or observe what they're doing and and say, did you know? Because articulating what you are doing is mm -hmm. kind of hard if you're doing it, but having a conversation yeah. and talking about it can really be very revealing. Yes, I I, I do have to warn you though, because <laughs> if you if you dangle that carrot in front of me, I may run with it and oh, come up with too many patterns and no, too many heuristic ideas. That's fine. <laughs> it's funny because um, just recently um, a friend had asked me to um, sort of do a mind map um, with her uh, regarding some of the things that um, completely unrelated to to software development or anything, and uh, she had asked a. Uh, literally, I think four topics. And I was like, okay, sure. And so I started with these four topics. And I think it ended up with uh, um, about 500 lines, items. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And um, she looked at it and she said, oh, my God. 
as the one you asked for, but hopefully not not as uh, extensive with uh, with what well, you had so, mentioned. And I'm, I'm, I'm very serious. So people listening here, I, yeah. I'm a heuristic hunter, and I think that people, uh, you know, having conversations and, and pulling out heuristics and competing heuristics that you might have tried mm-hmm. or what's are important ones, and, and giving it back to people is, is a is a fun thing to do. So, Absolutely, I, I, yes. I <laughs> Sounds like it. I meet speakers at conferences, and I say, "Hey, I want to know about incident uh, management." You know, so mm-hmm. and I, what's you know, you're a tester. What are you know? So anyway, so I I, I find it fun. Sounds great. Sounds great. So um, <laughs> I'll definitely include uh, the information for um, folks who um, are interested to be able to contact you as well through your website and so forth. And uh, sure, sure, sure. also we'll... include, yeah. But th- but they have to tell me stories. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> well, okay. thank you so very much, Rebecca, for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and uh, hopefully talk to you soon. All right. Thanks so much. Have a good one. I hope you enjoyed my talk with Rebecca. Please join me next time as I unravel more topics surrounding Axon Framework, Axon Server, domain-driven design, CQRS, and event sourcing. Until then, have a great time and happy coding.